actual cost to relations for uh, some materials. So the first category of materials that we are going to consider is what is known as simple material. So let us just talk about this simple. So let me first define what I mean by the simple material. The definition uh, is a uh, material is said to be simple. Elasticity 
is a special case of this uh, particular material. So suppose if you just remove this s is equal to zero to infinity, right? So just f of x comma t. So that means at whatever is happening at the current time, uh, that will be elasticity, right? So that whatever the stress uh, dependent on the deformation gradient at the current itself. So th no, there is no history dependence. So that would be the case of uh, elasticity. And so uh, we will see that simply by dropping the history dependence in this particular relation, we will get the relations for elasticity. Okay. So so uh, so as I said, that this topic will be sort of theoretical. But uh, later on, we will simply drop the history dependence and get to the special case of elasticity, which of course has uh, many many applications. Okay. So now we will start with a the theorem on this. Uh, seen now that uh, the chi star of x comma t star is q of t times chi of x comma t plus u t. So this is the uh, relation that links the motion of the two observers. Right? And so uh, we need uh, the quantity, so in whatever we are going to do, we will need this particular quantity, so that is f star of x comma t star minus s. Right? So that is because so for the star of the world, we will need f star first and then t star so corresponding to that. And of course s will still range from 0 to infinity. So this quantity, so in order to evaluate this particular quantity, first let us look at f star of uh, x comma t star. Okay? So this is equal to q times del chi of x comma t and so that is equal to q of t times f of x uh, comma t. Okay. So this, this relation we have already seen. Right? Uh, so this is uh, uh, just something that we have uh, derived earlier. Now this I can write as, so if I take now t star is equal to t minus a. Right? The clocks, we discussed the clocks are set differently. So this uh, is equal to q of t star plus a times f of x comma t star plus a. And so uh, if you now write f star, so from this particular relation now, if you write f star of x comma t star minus s, that is equal to q of t star plus a minus s <laughs> times f of x t star plus a minus a. So there is a multiplication of these two objects. So this, uh, uh, this is q times t star plus a minus s multiplied by f times x times t star plus a minus s. And this I can now write as a equal to q times t minus s because uh, t star plus a is t itself. So q of t minus s times f of x of t minus s. So basically, uh, as I said, we required this particular quantity here, and that is what I have derived it now. That is uh, Q of t minus s times f of uh, x of t minus s. So now we are in a, a position to uh, see what are the consequences of material frame and difference. Okay, for, uh, for this simple material. Okay. So let us now uh, derive a particular result. So. So MFI now, what is the implication of MFI now? So, uh, so response for the Cauchy stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
q uh, of the transport right so this relation uh, is is whatever i am writing here that means this uh, l star is now f star okay and uh, this l is whatever we just showed that f star is q of t minus s times f of x t minus s and then that is equal to q times tau f of l times uh, q transpose so that is this uh, this is l so in this particular case the list of grammatical variables is simply the deformation gradient uh, along with its history of course but that is a list of grammatical variables in this particular case so so this is the restriction that is imposed by material frame difference now okay so your tau hat should be such that it satisfies this particular here so let us call it as a uh, star yeah. so this is a um, so let us call this as star okay now let us discuss the implications of material frame difference so uh, here Yeah, fine. 
So this is the polar decomposition, and then uh, we will get that uh, f of x of t minus s is equal to r of x t minus s times u of x of t minus s. Okay. So if we now write um, tau hat of uh, uh, so um, yeah. so this uh, so basically instead of this f. Let me put the deformation gradient there. Okay, so this. Uh, so from this, if you now see, right? So you write uh, this um, Q of t minus s so here in star. In star, you choose now. Choose uh, your Q of t minus s. As R of x of t minus s. Okay, so this is allowed because this x is fixed. See, whenever we are discussing constant relations, we are discussing the constant relation at a given x. Okay, so we are not considering the constant relations at different points here. So this x is a fixed uh, uh, quantity, right? A fixed vector. So you are we are looking at constant relations uh, at this particular point. And so, uh, since this x is fixed, we can take q of t minus s as r of uh, this one. Then you will see that this, uh, when I take this, then uh, f is um, uh, uh, r u. So you can write this in the following way. So uh, yes, so let us just write that. So if we choose now.
exactly this particular object. And so we substitute this object, then you will see that f inverse times f is identity. Then f inverse, f transpose times f inverse transpose is also identity here. So that will give us that, uh, uh, so we will get that uh, this is e equal to, uh, so let me just write it as s tilde of s is equal to 0 to infinity of x comma f transpose f of x of t minus s where this s tilde uh, s tilde of s is equal to 0 to infinity of x comma c of x t minus s is equal to determinant of u times uh, uh, u inverse of x comma t times tau hat of s is equal to 0 to infinity of x comma u of x t minus s times u inverse of x comma t. So since u is equal to under root of uh, c here. Right? So, uh, so after you substitute, right? So if you substitute for this tau hat, uh, this particular expression into uh, here, then as I said, that your f inverse times f is equal to identity and so on. And determinant f is determinant r times determinant of u. Determinant r is plus 1. So it becomes determinant of u. So that's how you get determinant of u, for u. Then u inverse and all these other things. So basically, now it reduces to a function of c. Right? So the second theorem of stress is uh, dependent on the history of the right pushing between strain and so So that is a very, very important conclusion that has come out as a restriction of imposed by material train right? So, So initially, we did not assume that C is a uh, function of the right pushing green So we, we just simply assume that the second theorem of curve stress depends only on the history of the deformation gradient. But as a consequence of material gradient difference, the dependence on the uh, deformation gradient reduces to a dependence on the right Cauchy Green strain tensor. That is that transpose there. And so that is one of the most important conclusions that comes out of this uh, whole analysis here. Finally, we need to show that 3 implies 1. So what I just showed is 2 implies 3. Now let us show 3 implies 1. So, so we will start with this second theorem of uh, expression. So, so now 3 implies 1. So that is what I want to show. So I will start with tau uh, hat of uh, s is equal to 0 to infinity of x comma q of t minus s f of x t minus s uh, that is equal to determinant of q f inverse times q of t times f of x comma t times s hat s equal to 0 to infinity of x comma q of t minus s uh, sorry, this is into f of x t minus s times uh, uh, f transpose uh, q 
So here actually you have to get rid of the equation. See, uh, this q times f, right? So this is q times f. You can think of this as q times f. Now what you are doing is you are taking the transpose of this and multiplying it by so f. So here you are taking the transpose of this, the so q transpose times q times f because f transpose f. So here q f is playing the role of f, and so when we write f transpose f, you have to write it as in this particular way. Q transpose q is identity, so it becomes f transpose. F. So that is what I am writing here, and then that is nothing but s hat of x. So this is s hat of x comma f of x t minus s. Yeah, it should be the same as if you had not rotated it at all, right? So that is if 
your uh, that is this one is the unrotated thing. So that is the uh, so here you have your so suppose now you have your body like this, right? And now uh, you have you are applying some deformation gradient, and there is a stress associated with that. Now you are rotating, right? And then now you are applying again the same deformation gradient, correct? And then now we are seeing what the stress at this particular point is. That stress should be the same because now you can see that now you are looking at the properties in a different direction, right? And then those properties are still the same as the properties are here, right? And so this should be valid for all Q, and that is obvious. So this is valid for all Q. So that will correspond to looking at the properties in all possible directions. When you allow Q to uh, range over all the proper orthogonal tensors. This will be equivalent to looking at the properties in all uh, directions. So, so this is the definition of isotropy that we will adopt. Uh, the mathematical definition of isotropy that we will adopt. So, the important thing here is that uh, we should not confuse between material frame indifference and isotropy. Okay, so material frame indifference is uh, an axiom, correct? So, that is something that is universally true for all materials. We are saying that the form of the constant relation remains the same in all frames of reference. But when we are looking at isotropy, isotropy is an assumption about the nature of the material, right? So, so that is not an axiom. Okay, so, uh, so basically, we can have materials that are not isotropic, right? So, for example, in this particular material, if you had fibers that were running in this particular direction, then obviously the properties are going to be different in different directions, right? And then, in, so this is clearly a case. Where the material is not isotropic. So, so what you have to remember is that material frame indifference is an axiom. Okay. Whereas isotropy is an assumption that we are making about the nature of the material. But for most materials, I mean, uh, if you don't have something special like fibers running into the material or something, mostly you can make the uh, uh, assumption of isotropy. Right. Fine. So um, now what we will do is that we will combine the two notions of isotropy and material frame indifference and see what we get out of that. So let us uh, now prove the following theorem now. <coughs> so theorem. Uh, so the response function, the response uh, functional
always we are discussing constant relations we are always discussing constant relations at a given point and that could be different than the constant relations at some other point in the structure so anyway, so here uh, the particle is isotropic at x uh, then we have that tau hat of f uh, this is from s is equal to 0 to infinity is equal to tau hat of uh, vr uh, so here actually i am dropping the dependence on x so just I will note that here, dropping uh, the uh, dependence on x, dependence on x, uh, just for notation other convenience. I mean, uh, so the notation, the dependence on x is very much there, but to write it is very cumbersome. So just to avoid that writing effort, I am just dropping that x. But it is there. Okay, so so actually we do have an x here, but just as I said that I am just suppressing it because it gets very confusing otherwise to write the whole thing. So anyway, so this f now see for when we were uh, discussing material treatment difference, we use the decomposition R U. Now when we are discussing isotropy, we use the decomposition V R. That is other decomposition, okay, which involves the uh, uh, the the left uh, Cauchy green uh, strain tensor. Okay. So uh, because V is the square of the left Cauchy green strain tensor, right? So this uh, this involves that. So this is the equal to now now hat of v is infinite. So this is from s is equal to 0 to infinity. This is also from s is equal to 0 to infinity. So this uh, property uh, is just following from uh, uh, the property of isotropy. Right? So if you recall, we said that tau hat of f q is equal to tau hat of f right? for all q. So because the properties are the same in all directions. So here this q is playing the role of this r. And so, because of that, we will get tau hat of v itself, which is equal to tau tilde of v, because uh, s is equal to 0 to infinity, because uh, v, uh, so since uh, uh, v uh, square is equal to v, correct? So, that is equal to f at So, uh, because of that, uh, we can write it as tau tilde of uh, v itself. And uh, now, uh, let us show this other property that tau tilde has to satisfy this particular thing here. So, let us uh, prove that now. So, now, see, so far, I have not used the property of material difference. So, so far, I have used only isotropy. Now, I will combine the two notions of isotropy and uh, frame difference and see what we get. So we will get that uh, uh, Q times uh, tau bar from S is equal to 0 to infinity of B of Q transpose. So this is equal to Q of tau hat of F times uh, uh, Q transpose. So that is just this or whatever uh, this particular relation here. So tau tilde uh, of B is nothing but tau hat of f, right? And then we will use MFI. So this is nothing but uh, uh, tau hat of Q of f. Right? So, so this is all with the history dependence and with the dependence on x. I'm just simply suppressing all the arguments. But basically, it, uh, it will depend now on this QF. Right? Tau hat of QF is Q times tau hat of f times Q transpose. So this is the statement of material. Tilde. So this is tau tilde 
of Q B uh, Q. Okay. So uh, what we have shown now is that Q times tau tilde of B times Q transpose is tau tilde times Q times B times Q transpose. Okay. So this is uh, now an implication of assuming both isotropy and NFI. See, because I have already used isotropy while deriving this, and I have used NFI while going from this step to this particular step. And so we get this uh, uh, particular result here. Okay, now conversely, right? So because it's an if and only if uh, statement, we need to show the converse also. So let us do that. So conversely, now. Uh, strain tensor, right? So through this particular relation, and this tau theta 
has to satisfy this particular relation here, right? Uh, that uh, sorry, this particular relation. Tau delta of Q B Q transpose is Q times tau delta of B times uh, Q transpose here. Fine. So uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, concludes this part about the implications of uh, Bregman and Bregman isotropy for a simple material.
basically that is usually the assumption that we make, right? That uh, before you load a structure, the stresses within that structure are zero. So that is typically an assumption that we make. But if there are stresses, okay, so this can happen if you are doing some rolling of the component and then there will be stresses trapped inside that due to plasticity, correct? And then so there is some permanent deformation and then there are stresses locked inside the structure even though you are not applying any external load and so those would be called as residual stresses. But typically in this course we will assume that the residual stresses are zero and that is called as a natural state. Okay, so that is just some terminology here. So basically you will have that tau hat of uh, uh, x comma uh, i is equal to zero. So that is what uh, we will assume. Typically we will assume this uh, particular thing here. Fine. Now uh, let us look at um, uh, the response functional uh, or response functions for uh, the case of elasticity. Oh, 
infinity all i have done is that i have dropped that state dependence so basically we are saying that the constant relation now depends only on the uh, current state of the kinematical variables right and so the kinematical variables in this case is this f so so we get that this now has of x comma f this now tilde of x of uh, comma ff transpose right and then uh, so basically now if we assume that the material is isotropic and frame independent uh, the dependence of the cauchy stress tensor on f reduces to a dependence on b that is b is the uh, left cauchy green stress tensor right? so this is a very very important consequence of adopting material frame independence and isotropy and not only that this function this tau tilde whatever i have written that has to satisfy this particular restriction here so this is sorry this should be tau tilde here so this is also tau tilde so this uh, it has to also satisfy this particular restriction here so um, you can see that this restriction is now nothing but uh, the restriction that the tensor value function be isotropic correct and and then so now we can directly apply the rivlin erikson representation here and get a representation for tau tilde right because uh, uh, as i said that uh, this is nothing but the definition of a isotropic tensor value function so at that time uh, we just studied it within a mathematical framework without giving it any physical interpretation so now why it is called as an isotropic function will become clear because they you get the same result for an isotropic material right so that's a uh, a uh, reason maybe that it is called as an isotropic a uh, function right so this uh, so uh, so now we will uh, use the rivlin erikson theorem to get a uh, concrete expression for this uh, constitutive uh, constitutive uh, constitutive relation for a uh, isotropic frame independent material here yeah. yes so let us do that uh, This is uh, as a consequence of the Rivlin Erikson theorem. Consequence of the Rivlin Erikson uh, theorem. Then the second pair of upper cross stress depends on the right Cauchy green stress. So 
that also will follow from this. So you will get that S of x comma t, x comma t is equal to gamma naught, let us call it x comma invariance of c times identity plus gamma 1 of x comma invariance of c times c plus gamma 2 of x comma invariance of c uh, times uh, c square where of course c so here this b is equal to f of transpose and at the left pushing green strain tensor and c is equal to f transpose left is the right pushing green strain tensor here right so this is the implication that comes out of this uh, particular theorem okay so uh, first let us just prove this uh, particular result uh, so as i said that the first part just follows directly from the Euclidean Erickson theorem so there is nothing to prove here because that is just a direct consequence of the Riverine Erickson theorem, which we have already proved. So, all we need to prove is this particular direction here. Right? So, let's just show that. Uh, so, first thing is that uh, uh, the invariance of B and C are the same. So, that we have already seen. Uh, so, B is. Uh, so we have seen now that uh, uh, B is equal to R times C times R plus R. So this we have seen through the polar decomposition, we have seen that this particular result holds. And so because of that, we will get that invariance of B is R also the same as the invariance of C because they are orthogonally, they are equivalent here, right? And so we can now write, uh, so let us derive the constant relation for the second theorem of cross stress using the constant relation for a Cauchy stress here. So this is S hat of f is equal to determinant of f times uh, f inverse times tau hat of f times f inverse transpose. And so this is equal to determinant of f times uh, beta naught of uh, invariance of b times f inverse times f inverse transpose plus beta 1 of invariance of b times identity plus beta 2 of the invariance of b times f transpose there. So all I have done is that I am just uh, using the relation between the uh, second theorem of cross stress and the Cauchy stress. And, and then this is what I get after I substitute for tau hat this particular expression I am just substituting it here into this particular expression for tau hat and uh, this uh, determinant of f is square root of uh, the determinant of c the determinant of f is equal to square root of determinant of c that is because uh, c is f transpose f and so that determinant will be uh, equal to determinant of c is determinant of f square uh, because of the various properties of the determinant and de uh, determinant f belongs to lin plus correct we have assumed that determinant f is greater than zero and hence we can just write it as a square of determinant of c here. fine and so this is equal to under root of i3 of c times uh, beta naught times invariance of c so that is because we have shown that the invariance of b and uh, c are the same so that times c inverse plus beta 1 times uh, invariance of c times identity plus beta 2 times c itself. Okay. So uh, beta 2 of invariance of c times c. Uh, times c. Okay. And uh, then now we can use the Cayley Hamilton theorem to replace c inverse by i c and c squared. You can write, uh, so let me just write it here at the top here. Uh, so, uh, this uh, C inverse you can write as uh, 1 by I3 of C times C square minus I1 of C times C plus I2 of C times the algorithm. So this is nothing but the k angle here. So I can write it in this particular way. And uh, then now you see that this, uh, you can 
substitute for C inverse in this particular relation and you can get a relation in terms of uh, C square. Okay. So, uh, that other form that I have written, this gamma naught of invariance of C times identity plus gamma 1 uh, times C plus C square, that is obtained from this particular relation. Uh, so, this uh, so the new constants that you get, I am denoting them by gamma naught. Just like we use the Kelly Hamilton theorem for the second theorem of the cross stress, here also you can use the uh, Kelly Hamilton theorem and express B square in terms of B inverse. Uh, so I can also get tau in terms of I B B inverse. Okay, so that is also possible. So all those, so those will be just different forms of the uh, constant relation here. Right? So uh, now one important thing to note here is that uh, these constants here, right? This gamma naught, this uh, gamma 1 and this uh, gamma 2, these are unknown, correct? So, so that is one of the most uh, uh, important things to note here. So, uh, so although, so this i, c and c square, those are explicitly, those are explicit functions of c, but unfortunately these invariance functions we do not know. Uh, and so, uh, so we know the, that the constitutive relation for an elastic material must be of this particular form, but because we cannot, uh, because we do not know what these functions are, uh, we would still need to do some amount of guesswork now. Okay? And that is the reason you will see that there are so many uh, constitutive relations in the uh, literature. Right? So, the, so if you take a typical elastic material, there are so many different types of constitutive materials such as the octane material, Mooney Rivlin material, uh, Yao model and then the uh, Aruda boys and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are just uh, lots and lots of uh, constitutive models that you will see. So the reason is that because uh, they are trying to guess what the form of these uh, functions is. And, and so because we do not know what the form of these functions is, uh, each person is coming up with a different model. Uh, and of course, finally, the, uh, the thing is that you try to choose these functions such that you get a match against experimental results. Right? So that is the whole purpose. Uh, so typically, you know, this uh, nonlinear constant relations will be used for elasticity, uh, for rubber elasticity. Right? So, so there, as I said, all these uh, models that I mentioned, uh, the uh, Mooney Rivlin and uh, Ogden models and so on and so forth, they are mostly uh, developed for rubber type materials, okay, which are almost uh, incompressible. Uh, so that is where all these, uh, uh, see because uh, rubber type materials can undergo very large strains and so uh, you have to use a nonlinear constant relation in order to capture the uh, stress properly. Uh, you cannot use uh, a linear uh, stress strain relation in that particular case. So, uh, yeah, so the point here is that uh, you know, uh, this uh, because there are these three functions which we don't know. So now, uh, in the in the future class, we will look at what is known as hyper elasticity, and so there we will assume that the stress can now be derived as a derivative of the strain energy density function with respect to uh, some kinematical variable. So which would be the right Cauchy green strain tensor, for example, and then the task of finding these three functions is reduced to the task of finding only one strain energy density function. Okay, and so, so we will look at that. So typically whenever we discuss elasticity, we will always, almost always assume that it is hyper elastic. Uh, and so we will discuss that 